Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and I'm going to talk about weather whiplashing events uh, in North America and also in the uh, North Pacific Ocean. So many years ago, I coined the term weather whiplashing, weather weirding, weather wilding, extreme weather in the climate casino, you know, all of, all of these sort of things, as well as you know, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. So the rapid warming of the Arctic is affecting the circulation patterns of the atmosphere, atmospheric jet streams and the ocean currents as well. And since the jet streams carry about two thirds, well, since the atmospheric um, wind patterns carry two thirds of the heat from the equator to the poles, and the ocean currents carry one third of the heat. Whenever we're changing the polar temperatures, we're clearly affecting global circulation on the planet. So the jet streams are slowing down and becoming wavier and stuck in place, and that's causing increases in frequency, severity, and duration of extreme weather events. Um, now, these extreme weather events are being studied in ever more detail because they have huge ramifications on the functioning of society and our ability to grow food to feed the global population. Jennifer Francis and other authors in a very recent paper, which I'm going to discuss, actually use this term, which I coined years ago, weather whiplashing, and they study the whiplashing events where, for example, we go from uh, very, very, you know, cold winter temperatures to, say, a false spring, you know, very, very warm temperatures in the early spring, all the buds come out, and then after that, you know, winter's not over, so killing frost, you know, killing, killing the buds, causing huge agricultural uh, damages and loss of um, certain, certain food crops. Or, um, you know, the whiplashing can also be a um, hydrological whiplashing. So from a, from a very, very dry um, condition to torrential rains and flooding back to very, very dry, you know, in this periodic cycle. Um, and there's lots of good examples of both of these effects. So, you know, from, from the temperature um, effect, you know, we had a heat wave over Western North America recently and then that suddenly broke and it was a bit cooler and now we have another heat wave but with the um with the hydrological or precipitation whiplashing a few years ago there was huge amounts of rain in the mississippi river um, system and that water gathered in the river and we had record high levels record flood levels and they had to perform triage to release some of the water on, in rural areas to protect the, the cities. Then the year, the year following that record rainfall, record flooding of the Mississippi, uh, there was a record drought. Um, and the Mississippi River was at its lowest levels ever. In fact, to keep the channel open, you know, and it's got a huge economic impact within the U.S. To keep that channel open, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had to dynamite rocks on the riverbed. And then the third year, we had torrential rains leading to record flooding yet again, and the flooding even exceeded the previous year. So we're getting these weather whiplashing event, and I'm going to discuss this novel paper where you actually monitor the transition from one atmospheric state to another atmospheric state. You get an abrupt change from one long scale atmospheric pattern, you know, long scale being four days or longer, and then you get this modal change which causes a disruptive shift in the extreme temperature and precipitation that is associated with particular atmospheric patterns. Jet, basically, what we're seeing is that as the Arctic warms more and more, we're getting more weather whiplashing events when the Arctic, than when the Arctic was 
colder. And this is a very robust finding, an increase in frequency of weather whiplashing events with a warmer Arctic. So basically what you do is you take all of the data, um, the gridded data over North America, and uh, you take it, you take the pattern for each day and you put it into this uh, neural network and it generates this AI or nor artificial intelligence or neural network. It generates these so-called self-organizing maps. Um, so it, it takes all of the data over, you know, each day over many, many years and it does an objective pattern cluster analysis and it generates basically a matrix of three rows by four columns that represents the atmospheric pattern, the state of the atmosphere halfway up, which is about 500 hexapascal pressure or 500 millibar, the geopotential height analogies, and, and, and anomalies rather. So four days in a long duration pattern and then that shifts to another pattern within two days. So you can have drought going to torrential rain with flooding, then back to drought, or you can have a heat wave, a cold spell, and a heat wave. So there's different thresholds and there's a bit of math done. You measure the, the Euclidean distances between different states. The longer the Euclidean distances, the um, more um, abrupt change there is in the state. So, you know, I said the frequency, severity, and duration of the extreme weather events is increasing. Um, the weather whiplashing event frequency is increasing. So this is analyzed using reanalysis data on temperature and rainfall, and also in the future to see what's going to happen in the near-term future to midterm future using climate models, uh, using the RCP 8.5 scenario. And uh, like I said, there's lots of examples of this whiplashing. For example, the false spring um, is, a, is a good example. Now, weather whiplashing events are distinct from the passage of fronts that are associated with progressive synoptic, synoptic weather weather systems so there's a there's a and, and they look at the variability because you could have precipitation whiplash and i gave the mississippi river example it also happened in ottawa big floods record dry year big even bigger floods over three years you can have the temper temperature whiplash heat wave colder back to heat wave um and that so uh, the precipitation whiplash is also called the drought pluvial seesaw. Okay, so this paper looks at the abrupt shifts in these large scale circulation regimes. And it, um, so you have a, a persistent situation and then you have a change. Um, and, uh, you know, it looks at these at all of these events and it avoids confusion with synoptic features like f weather fronts squall lines, tropical storms, plus the shifts in low level winds for, due to different surface types. So, you know, the, the features that cause onshore breezes, offshore breezes, changes from downslope wind flow to upslope, and the change that occurs in winds for say from forests to grasslands, where the forests slow down the wind speed, and as it goes into the grasslands, the wind speed then further increases because there's less resistance um, from the grass. Um, it's much shorter vegetation. As long as you have the pressure difference, you'll get faster winds. Okay, so um, so like I said, you have lar these large 2D data sets of temperature and precipitation. You push them into the neural net and it generates these um, self-organizing maps. And uh, it's you can have any number of them, but 12 seems to be a very good workable number. Um, and I'll show you what these maps are in just a second. Um, and I will go through the data in detail. Okay, so let, let me do that right now. Let's go back to my computer monitor, which has fallen asleep. So let's wake it up. Okay, so 
these are the self-organizing maps. So this is so what you do is you take all of the data over the years for for temper for for the these are the height um, 500 hexapascal geopotential heights. So this is very warm areas, the so red where the geopotential height is is anomaly is positive and it's cold where it's negative. So, um, you know, this would be the position of the, um, uh, of, uh, well, that's, that's the gist of it. So you have all these different patterns that are, the, the neural network picks these out and they look at the, um, they look at this from winter, January, February, March, and summer, July, August, September is in parentheses. So in winter, 15% of the time, you get an extremely warm Arctic cooler at lower latitudes. This is the anomaly. So the Arctic is much, much warmer than normal. Um, and 17% of the time um, is, is the, um, over the long data set, the Arctic is cold. This is the, the normal state. This is what we're shifting to. We're seeing a lot less of this in recent times and a lot more of this in recent times, this mode here. Now this mode here, you know, if you take the um, warm air and rotate it, okay, rotate it, you can get this pattern and this pattern. Um, this would be a very strong ridge here, a very strong trough here of the jet stream, this pattern. And then, you know, there's variants where this, the, the warmth gets weaker um, and you know, you can see the different states here. So this is very strong warming in the Arctic and then it could shift to the right and shift here, you know, or it can shift the other way. So you can imagine this image being rotated and the intensity decreasing. So these are the states. So this is a very common state. Now in the winter state, there's a lot of variability in the winter. The winter is the first number, but if you look at the summer numbers, each of these states is roughly equal. It's about uh, seven, eight, or nine percent in the summer. So each of these modes is reached more often in the summer, but sp but specific modes on the corners here are reached more with higher frequency in the winter. And I'll, I'll continue to be referring to this image, uh, but I want to show you here. This is a paper, so just uh, Google this title: "Measuring Winter Whiplash Events." in North America, a new large-scale regime approach uh, with uh, Jennifer Francis here. So the key points are we, we measure the weather whiplash events, the WWEs, um, and they're defined as an abrupt transition from one large-scale atmospheric pattern to another. And we're, this is just done for North America. When a weather whiplashing event occurs, it causes disruptive shifts in extreme temperatures and precipitation that is associated with these particular atmospheric patterns. And when the Arctic is warm, a warm Arctic anomaly atmospheric pattern spawns more weather whiplashing events in a cold Arctic patterns, okay? So that's the basic idea. Um, and, uh, you know, there's all kinds of examples of weather whiplashing. I've given some in the introduction, but a common one is we go from a frigid cold spell to anomalous wor warmth, or we go from anomalous warmth to a cold spell, or we go from drought to prolonged precipitation or prolonged precipitation to drought. So measuring these things is very, is vital because they have a huge impact on society. So from the data, the neural net generates these self-organizing maps. These matrix, uh, this matrix of representative atmospheric patterns in 500 hexapas hexapascal geopotential height anomalies is created. That's these, these 12 uh, um, different patterns. And then you measure from the shift from one to the other and the further the patterns are away, the distance. So these guys here are very far away. So that's a huge abrupt change if you go from one to the other. Same as these are huge, you know, in, in, the, in the corners. Thanks for listening and I'll continue this video. Bye for now.